Um, Mark Levitt is a writer, filmmaker, performer who has worked in over 65 countries. Mark's first two films, Stories in Stone and Woven in Time, are about different topics pertaining to the Narragansett. His third in process, which we're about to hear about tonight, is on the Triple Decker. Um, Mark is also a writer, as I mentioned. He has published three books, Changing Curriculum Through Stories. Cha um, three books, yes, Changing Curriculum Through Stories, Character Education for Ages 10 to, through 12, and A Holistic Approach for Cultural Change, Character Education for Ages 13 to 15 with Roman and Littlefield, and Putting Everyday Life on the Page with Corin Press. Um, Mark Levitt is also a land use and educational act activist in uh, Wakefield, Rhode Island, where he lives with his wife, four children, and um, I'm going to stop there, but Mark will be back. You can see him on your screen, so welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you uh, for asking me to come and uh, show a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a film that, I, that, that we brought. And, uh, but I only have two kids, so you got me really scared when you said four. Oh, two four-year-olds, <laughs> right. Not anymore, they're now, they're now almost seven years old, but I can't imagine, <laughs> and I'm sure none of you out there could imagine what it'd be like to have four seven-year-old kids. <laughs> Thank you Sorry very much. Sorry about that, Barbara. I appreciate it. <laughs> there you go. Well, um, let's start just very quickly and talk about what is a three-decker? And I throw up two quotes. I'm gonna read the first one because it's a little difficult. You can all read the second one, which is from Historic New England Magazine, an article that uh, Sally Zimmerman wrote for us. And the WPA or Work Project, Work Pro Project Associ uh, Association um, summary from 1934, 1936, this was a report, says that three deckers, uh, a three-decker house is a structure containing three dwelling units, each of which, which occupies a complete floor. The structure may be either freestanding or attached. Now, that is um, a basic, basic definition. Um, you can see a more fully uh, described one below that, again, from Historic New England magazine. And um, Historic New England has had a history of working with triple deckers, and I'll mention that in just a bit. Um, you can see that there were regional variations, and not every single triple decker had a uh, flat roof, as you can see here. And in the years between 1880 and 1930, 16,000 houses, triple deckers, sprung up in Boston alone, and that housed about 192,000 people in Boston. And I thank Mark for uh, sending in some of these um, images for you to see. Now, um, Arthur Quim, who you're gonna actually hear about in the film, you can read what he had to say about these uh, architectural forms, the triple decker or three decker, are curious, part urban and part suburban. Um, Arthur is an, uh, an urban uh, geographer, architectural historian, uh, and uh, one of the experts on triple deckers. Um, and I'm wondering here, as part of the audience here, how many people in this audience actually grew up or have some affiliation with um, triple deckers? And we had such a response of people saying they were going to attend. I suspect there's quite a few of you out in the audience. And I'm just showing you um, a few um, images of triple deckers that Mark sent along. Um, and I want to go back to Arthur Krim and show you a map of concentration of, of the triple deckers in New England. Now, they were originally, again, they're a post-Civil War phenomena, um, concentrated in mill towns and industrial cities. And if you see that concentration over on the right of the image, that's around Boston and the suburbs of Boston. But you can also see, if you look very carefully, Worcester is very prominent there. You can also see there are things in Manchester, New Hampshire. Go up the map almost to the top and you will see Portland and Bitterford. 
So it's really a New England uh, phenomena, the triple decker. And these, um, as I said, you could find triple deckers in actually all of the New England states. And we have images, but I'm just gonna show you some from Maine here to see the variety and the variety of styles. Um, these next two are from Connecticut, Hartford area here. And I wanted you just really to see the variety of them. Woonsocket, Providence, Worcester being uh, one of the major centers for triple decker. And there are many triple deckers in Worcester that are on the National Register for Historic Places, I'm pleased to say. Um, here you see some more. New Bedford being another, another um, concentration of, of triple deckers. Um, not all are wood, as you can see from here in Salem. So much variety in them. And of course, as I was saying, the industrial cities like Lawrence and Boston and Dorchester, you can see a variety in a variety of shapes and conditions. And this is one of the things that will come out a bit uh, in Mark's film. Historic New England has been very, very um, interested in worker housing and affordable housing. This is an issue uh, from fall 2013 with an article, a great article by Sally Zimmerman again on uh, triple deckers. Uh, if you're members, you should have access to that. Really good article. In our collections, uh, we also have architectural drawings of triple deckers. These are relatively rare. This was essentially worker housing. Uh, so these are the types of things that don't survive. This is on Calumet Street in Roxbury. This building does survive. I have a few images. I checked today and one of this is now an apartment building as it was then. Uh, one floor is going for over $3,800, the apartment. Uh, that's pretty current today, uh, pretty amazing. And here you can see the plan with, if you look at the bottom, the parlor behind it, the kitchen and bedrooms in the very back here. So Historic New England is fortunate to have these collections and these photographs uh, this from um, Roxbury um, and others in our collection. So we're actively collecting. Um, it's relatively rare to find interiors. So we're really interested in finding uh, interiors of how people lived and actually used it, these houses. Um, we continue to intersect historic New England. This is a project I worked on. It's one of our uh, everyone's history projects. If you go to our website, you can find it, and I'll put up that address in just a second. Uh, this is where we interviewed um, current residents of this neighborhood in Haverhill. Um, and tra traditionally, these triple deckers have been workers' housing, but immigrant housing over the years. And today, many of us associate who have aff affiliations with them, whether it's family. Uh, or mainly family, uh, have a nostalgia for these things. Um, Historic New England also hosted a conference. Again, uh, Sally Zimmerman uh, was a big part of putting this together for us in 2018 um, on a, affordable housing, one of our great interests. The situation, you know, wasn't always pretty. And I'll let you, I'll, I'll read actually this. This is a report. There were reformers in New England, reformers around the country were looking at slums, were looking at tenements um, as they were in many cases a bad thing. Um, this report, and this is true, this is from um, an annual report of the Massachusetts Civic League, as you can see, 1911. But there were also laws, um, reports, and then laws against triple deckers and Providence and other cities. And why? Because they said that they were um, a threatening danger. Foreigners are coming in in increasing numbers and with them are also coming the shack, the converted house, which has seen better days, the familiar frame tenant and the wooden three decker, which besides being objectable on all grounds is a flimsy fire trap and a menace to human life. And this was really a reaction against immigrants to some degree. Um, so they were actually laws, as I said, prohibiting um, further building um, in towns like 
Providence, towns like Boston. I'm gonna end with a, a personal story because Mark asked me to. My mother grew up in a triple decker and it's kind of hard to see, but it's the last house on the left. Um, this is part of the docu, this photograph is part of the documentia, documentaria series on Neptune Road. Um, the collection is now housed in the National Archives um, and the airport is on the other side of the trees at the end. Um, and you can see on the photograph on the bottom a little clearer, um, the blue line ran right there, cutting uh, Neptune Road in half. And on the other side were more triple deckers and the actual airport. Um, the airport bought these triple deckers one by one and tore them down. It was very controversial. Um, and to make amends less than a decade ago, uh, they made Neptune Road, a portion of it, into a park to Triple Deckers, and that's what you're looking at now, um, and you can see it. In the sidewalk, um, they've actually put the numbers of the houses as, that are part of this park that were torn down. My grandmother's, where I spent most of my childhood, was number 24, um, and you can see they actually outlined the Triple Deckers um, in granite there. And I actually have the numbers 24 from the actual house that was torn down uh, that my grandparents lived in. They were fortunate to be able to buy the entire building. Uh, at one point they lived on the second floor and then um, in my lifetime, they lived on the ground floor before my grandmother passed away and was eventually sold to the airport. So I, I have a personal family connection and feel really, uh, close to them. And I think they are an amazing building type that served thousands and thousands of immigrants coming in and still to continue to, the, to this day to. But there are threats with preservation and there are threats um, also with um, the immigrants getting pushed out as these become more desirable for people working in other industries and rents going up. And Mark touches on that. So Mark, I think at this point, I should turn this back to you because people are really here to hear about uh, you and to hear about your film. So I'm gonna let you do the lead in to the film and you tell me when to put it on. I will. Thank you, uh, Claire, and thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it, Ken, and, and uh, thank Historic uh, New England for inviting me here today and welcome all of you. And thank you for coming out in the cold to come to this event. And by the way, I um, hope you're wearing masks and are six feet away from each other. Nice to see you all out there. If I could, I'm sure I would really be enjoying seeing you, but uh, maybe another time. Anyway, I'll tell you briefly, uh, I got interested in triple deckers when I moved to Boston. I'd lived in San Francisco, not moved to Boston, moved to uh, Rhode Island. I was living in San Francisco before that, Ithaca before that, where I grew up in New York City. And uh, I began to understand that there were these structures that uh, uh, contained uh, the history of really immigration into New England. And I got fascinated by it and I created a piece that I wrote on um, a fictional triple decker. And it was a story of the comings and goings of seven or eight uh, immigrant groups backed by musicians from each one of those groups and the story about how they actually came here, but also, and more importantly, how they were changed by virtue of uh, their relationship to one another. So I've always had it in my head uh, to be interested in triple deckers from, uh, I think this maybe, I don't know, 1980. And I started to make films about 15 years ago, made two films about Native Americans. And I was thinking of a, a third film and I began to realize, well, I might as well do one on Triple Deckers. And it's been an incredible experience. Obviously, uh, in the last uh, year and a half, I haven't been able to go out and film and the funding is difficult to get at this point as well. But when everything clears up, we'll finish the film. So what you're going to see has nothing to do with what the final uh, film is going to look like. It's simply 20 minutes of a compilation of some of the footage that I, uh, I took uh, and uh, with, with my, my filmmaker. And uh, 
it it's it's uh was done it to uh to go along with a, a grant that i got part of the stipulation was that i had to give them about a 20 minute uh, piece so that's what you're about to see again i want to remind you that it's not what the film is going to look like all I tried to do was sort of summarize some of the major themes going on in the uh, in the in the, in the in the triple decker. And Will Lepsick, who is the uh, the cinematographer, and I did a lot of filming, but we knew we had plenty to go. So again, what you're going to see is something that's going to be uh, uh, interesting, but it's not the final product. And I really, really, really would love to answer questions. Will watch 20 minutes of this and then uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the film and then uh, we'll just uh, answer questions. We have a long time and again I appreciate you coming and uh, it, it's uh, it's going to be fun. Thanks Mark. And wish I could see you. So why don't we start it up okay uh, yes. Ken and uh, enjoy. Stan Goldstein. I grew up in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, born there with my brother and another person. We started CBS. I lived in a tenement house on Burnside Avenue, uh, a three-decker. We lived on the second floor. My grandmother and aunt lived on the third floor. I'm Mullen Sawyer. I'm the president and CEO of Oak Hill Community Development Corporation here in Worcester, Massachusetts. The triple decker model itself is really great. There's a front porch, a back porch, three levels of apartments on top of one another. And the three deckers were built for the folks who worked in the factories and worked in the mom and pa stores so that they could walk to work and, and walk to religious services in the weekend and, and create community life. My name is Safiya Bashir Hirsi, and I'm basically born Ethiopia, but I'm from Somalia. I moved into a three-story apartment, and it was my first time to live that kind of apartment. It was new, and it was surprised me. I became a neighbor, people who have not been seen a lot of no color people. Growing up, of course, uh, I personally lived in a three-decker with a five families. Uh, one unit on the first floor, two in the second, and two on the third floor. We lived in the third floor rear, and they used to collect uh, rent on a weekly basis, so in socket, not monthly. And my recollection is our rent was between four and five dollars a week. My name is Joseph Volpe. Um, I live at 36 Stanton Street, Worcester, Massachusetts. This is this three decker is 34 and 36. The first floor is 34, the second floor apartments are 36 Stanton Street. Well, when I was around 12 years old, my parents, uh, we lived in a six family home uh, not far from here. And they thought the best, uh, the best way to do it was to purchase a three family home and to uh, um, you know, have a couple of rents and uh, help support the mortgage payments. The emotional bonds of being here and living here, you know, um, are the reasons I'm still here. In our particular tenement, uh, there was two bedrooms and they were cell-like because uh, everything was off a huge, good-sized kitchen. One bathroom, bathroom had no windows. This was truly um, tenement. We were in a strip where there were like six, three decades in a row. 
The interior of the three-decker uh, has a, a Janus-like quality to it. I think the architects or the builders intended the rooms to have formal Victorian functions. The front room, the parlor, uh, the middle room, perhaps a dining room, uh, the rear rooms were the bedrooms. Um, but in fact, with large immigrant families, this was not often the case. Uh, the dining room became a bedroom or the living room, the parlor became the dining room or the bedrooms were doubled up um, into um, multiple uh, residence bedrooms. I would always uh, visit my grandmother who was on the third floor. So it was simple walking up one flight of stairs from where we lived and uh, We'd do errands for her if she needed something to the grocery store and stuff like that. So it was uh, like living together, but living separately. My grandparents lived in a three-decker, as did my mother. And uh, it's always been a, a source of uh, fascination, which is uh, amplified by the fact that I went to school in Worcester College at Clark, a city full of three-deckers. To be frank with you, I never thought of coming to the United States. Unknown to me, this friend of mine who is now a professor filled in this form of, um, what they call it, lottery, national visa lottery. And then I think about several months later, I got a package Congratulations, big one like this. Congratulations, you and your family qualify to come over to the United States. Of America. Hmm. I began to sort of specialize in three decker research. It became, at least for East Massachusetts, if not for much of New England, the go to uh, multiple family uh, housing stock. Um, for the immigrant housing. Prince, my wife, and the entire family of the Aubrey men came over to the United States. I believe Triple Deckers have a political function, if you will, in the sense that when, in again, in the, research, in the research on the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence in 1912, in the research on the strike that followed, you can see when you look at something as uh, fascinating as the arrest records, <laughs> people coming out of blocks uh, and engaging in strike activity, you definitely have a sense of ownership of the place. You don't have the atomization that ultimately suburban life, Levittowns um, and other things create. The, the triple deckers and the, and the community that they foster lend themselves to um, people being together in more public spaces and in more public ways. The, the, the strike in Lawrence in 1912, known as the Bread and Roses strike, was a real explosion in American history. But in Lawrence, what became interesting was that because of the dense population, because of the triple deckers, you had all sorts of different ethnicities living together. It was immigrants and so-called unskilled workers who went to strike, not the usual AFL craft unions. So until that moment, most strikes and most labor organizing and labor unions had been generated and propelled by skilled laborers, uh, laborers and by the whole idea that there was a difference between skilled, the aristocracy of labor and the less skilled immigrant workers and, and just uh, the sort of proletariat that was not of use to labor unions, which included women because women shared these female responsibilities, the traditional responsibilities of food preparation and laundry and childcare, why didn't they talk to each other? They had to talk to each other. And what that meant for me and for the strike was a new way of thinking about how solidarity came about, not through the unions or even through the IWW, the industrial workers of the world. Solidarity really began to come about at the local grocery stores where women operated. It came about through the sharing of these traditional responsibilities through women and comparing wage packets. But when women were coming home, uh, there was Italians and Syrians and Lithuanians all kind of comparing at the local grocery store 
and then bringing that conversations into the tenements. And that was reinforced when I began to look at who was arrested during the strike. And I began to then find out through the manuscript census schedules where these women lived. So I had 85 women arrested during the strike and they all lived in communities pretty much near each other, but about 20 of them lived on top of each other. They all lived in the same tenements. With the front porch, and you sat on the front porch, and you just watched the cars go by, whoever's going, oh, hi, Miss So-and-so, and you start talking. And so you commune that way. And sitting on the front porch, also, you'd have your dessert, maybe after dinner, sitting out on the front porch, having your dessert. And, um, and you'd talk with each other, and you'd have friends, and you'd be speaking to people and driving by. And uh, so it was all communal. I met with the elders, the Somali elders, and I met with the officials from the city of Portland, and housing had become saturated in Portland. So they said, do you think you could, you, the city of Lewiston, could accommodate a few families coming into the city? I said, sure, no problem. Well, lo and behold, that I know it was more than a few families. It was the fastest influx, the more families coming into any one place at any particular time. I, at one point, I had 1,000 units. I'm down to 300, right about 300. I don't even know how many we have. But percentage of that, that immigrant, probably maybe right now, 25, 30%. Without those triple-deckers, you know, I don't know where these folks would have found housing. When the Somali people came here, the, fin the, the financial reality of it was a, like a boom was good because now having 30, 40 percent vacant buildings, now you could fill them. This is my home. Uh, it's been a family home for years. So it was my parents' home and originally an aunt's home who had their house built in 1924. These buildings were becoming empty and now they, they, they're, they're full again. This would be an empty, boarded up city without these immigrants. So I think some people don't realize how much positive impact they've had because of that. But the first real wave of immigrants was the Irish. So when the French Canadians started coming in, it wasn't funny because uh, people, you know, the Irish burnt the French Canadian church down. Uh, they had big, big, big fights on the Main Street Bridge to the point where they would throw each other in the, in the river. Uh, when they saw the, the, the young guys going up on Ash Street near the Basilica uh, with their batons and whatnot. Oh, the French and Irish are going to be rumbling and whatnot. People forgot that, you know, that happened then. So it, the strife that was happening today actually was kind of mild compared to what happened then. A lot of white people who were in, occupying the same building as us, uh, first of all, were, were in a state of shock. <laughs> they were shocked. They didn't understand why all these people who looked very, very different um, and, and, you know, religiously different. We were not going to churches like them. We were not wearing the same clothes. Our food smelled really like you cook goat meat and it doesn't come out of the hallways. It's there and it sticks there. People had forgotten that we are a community of immigrants. There was concern, particularly by the old established Yankee political stock that the three deckers were affecting the property values or were bringing in the unwanted European immigrant population was quite strong. And many of the Boston suburbs, Arlington, Belmont, did put restrictions on three family housing construction. I have the Koran, I've read the Koran. I read these books because I wanted to understand how these people think and what makes them, you know, act the way they do and, and, and how they did. To try to understand their culture. You understand their culture, you can get along with them a lot better. Well, there was a family that lived in a three-decker directly across the street from me, and they were Jewish. And they didn't, on the Sabbath, transact any money. So when I go to collect my, my paper route money, the lady would open the door and she would tell me, go into the pantry and on the counter was the money along with the, a tip. On the way out, I would meet her two sons that were my age and I would invite them to come play a baseball game we would play out on the street. 
And the two guys would say, nope, we have to read our books. We can't go. It's the Sabbath. And my friend, my friends and I, we didn't, we didn't ridicule them or laugh at them because being Catholic, the next day I was out there reading my book and I had to go to church to services. So they went to the synagogue. I went to the church. And we grew up that way. And I, th I look back on it now and I reflect how, how tolerant we were of each other's differences. After the First World War, there were uh, multitudes of three-deckers built, particularly in the established cities like Worcester, like Haverhill, like Lawrence, like Brockton, like New Bedford, uh, Southbridge, Massachusetts, um, uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, but again, the elaboration of the architectural styles uh, was minimalized just because the labor costs had run up so high. As the post-World War II period progresses, Lawrence's population falls quite dramatically from 85, 90,000 to pushing around 55, 60,000. And so a lot of housing, a lot of triple deckers become vacant. Uh, and then the cities like Lawrence begin to conceive of, okay, well, maybe we should take down some of these neighborhoods and we can build industrial parks or high rises or whatever. Uh, and maybe that will attract a new group of people back into the city. And so in many respects, in the eyes of city developers and planners, triple deckers become expendable. Oh, they're not the porches down. The porches are nice, but he just tore them down instead of repairing them. And the same thing with these. These are about to go too. I don't, I don't know. He can't knock these down. But he's just planning to put a, what he was saying, just plywood down and try and just stabilize it instead of bringing it back to where it was. And, and in other words, he just doesn't like doesn't care about the house, and it's a shame because it's a nice house. In the 40s and 50s, the industry that's in Lawrence and in Lowell is finally exiting once and for all. So the population now shrinks because if anybody's able, they follow the work. That basically creates empty triple deckers. Not only did Dominicans and Puerto Ricans not bring poverty to Lawrence, this urban crisis, this widespread economic decline in the city actually preceded their arrival and it was something they then had to reckon with. Latino settlement was constrained, one might say segregated within the boundaries of Lawrence, specifically by the geography, the landscape, the built environment of the city and its suburbs, that Lawrence with its triple deckers, with its subsidized housing projects from after World War II, Lawrence provided access to rental housing to apartments that the suburbs had been intentionally built to exclude. Urban renewal in the post-war decades, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, was an explicit attempt by city elites to get out the old, and draw in some new, to get rid of what existed in Lawrence, to draw in new capital, new resources, new residents to the city. And it failed. It wasn't until the people already here had the resources and the support to transform the city that that renaissance really occurred. I needed a point of entry into the market. My partners and I, we all identified that there was not, there was no sustainable way yet proposed to how to renovate a triple decker that would cause a lasting positive impact. I used to live in the three decker, the one right behind the camera, until um, we got kicked out by sustainable comfort. Companies are buying up uh, properties and they're kicking out the people that live in them. Never feels good to walk into someone's home, to introduce yourself as the new owner and say, you can't stay. We've approached this from multiple perspectives. One, we want to preserve the neighborhood from kind of a meta sense. It's less about if we can preserve every casing, every detail in a kitchen, but more about how do we preserve what the triple decker represented in a neighborhood, which was high density, accessible living. I used to live here on the third floor and I was one of the people that was asked to move out when they came and renovated the place for, I guess, for the new biotech crowd that's coming in. One of the dangerous things about focusing on the built environment and improving those buildings is that that creates a need to increase rental rates, which has social impacts. 
the people who lived in this building before were a very different demographic than who are moving in now. So I don't think of it as displacement in that way, um, but more as kind of an introduction of a another possible demographic. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Mark. That was um, really, really amazing. Um, sorry. I, I still like it. <laughs> I think that says a lot. I still really love it. I, I love the people in it and I love the stories and I love the buildings and it's not even the way the film's gonna look, but I still love it. I, I, I just uh, resonate with the stories and resonate with the people and uh, got lucky in a lot of ways to meet just fantastic people, all of whom had some uh, element of the story to discuss themselves. Um, before I continue, let me give you my email and then we can talk and answer some questions. It's M-A-R-C-J-O-E-L-L-E-V-I-T-T at gmail.com, that's Mark with a C, Mark Joel Levitt at gmail.com. And I'm still in the process, just so you know, uh, of raising funds. I need about $100,000. So if anybody is interested, uh, please get in touch with me. Some portion of that would be fine as well. And you might even join our advising uh, uh, producer uh, at the opening and who's Danny Glover, the actor and uh, uh, He's been gracious enough to, uh, to, to be our advising producer. So I'd love to hear from you and uh, you uh, can help history being made. This is the only uh, triple decker film that I know. And I'm really, really happy you, you're here today to, to be part of it. Mark, it, enc uh, it encompassed so much of the issues surrounding triple deckers today in terms of gentrification, taking them away from the continuous wave of immigrants um, and people's love of them. So Claire, should we go to some questions in our remaining time? Um, yes, let's go to questions. Um, so uh, for our first question, why three? So why three floors and why, or in, as opposed to four or any other number of floors in these buildings? Well, it wouldn't have been a triple decker without three floors. <laughs> <laughs> they there was a there was certain uh strictures in zoning they wouldn't let them do four floors uh there were certainly two floors but the three just made it exactly financially correct as well i mean as you know the uh history of the three deckers is that often one family would move in their cousins and aunts would move on on the first floor and the second floor um as far as I know, that's really the reason. I think there are probably zoning issues. Although mm -hmm. what's very interesting is in cities like Providence, Rhode Island, where they've been, where they were banned during that time, uh, in the sort of the fear of immigrant wave, uh, they had two floors that were very specifically two floors, and then sort of a third kind of looked like an attic, but in reality, mm -hmm. uh, it was a, 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 a an apartment. And uh, we're very proud in Providence, Rhode Island, and Rhode Island in general to uh, know how to get by. <laughs> uh, what Was it at all common for a large family that owned a triple-decker to build an internal staircase between the first and second or second and third floors to make it efficient, uh, it, to make it, in effect, a two-story apartment within, within a triple-decker? So did people convert them into... Um, interior, you know, the interior spaces into larger home spaces. Well, they, you know, it, nowadays the original inhabitants are mostly not there, and mm -hmm. probably the families of them. So, a lot of them have been made into condominiums. A lot of them have been uh, uh, altered, so to speak. I don't know any stories of the people who were there in the 
1880s to the 1920s, who changed the configuration of the, uh, the uh, houses. One of the keys to those houses, and again, we'll talk more about this if you're interested and get in touch with me, but one of the interesting things in terms of configuration is the porches. Mm -hmm. Porches were really how social life was created. People would sit out on them and talk at night, have, have conversations, go up and down the stairs. In a, a, a one way, my feeling is that the triple deckers created the community that Putnam talks about in his book *Bowling Alone*. The, mm -hmm. What was he? What was part of our society before the atomization brought on? by many things, but certainly by the suburbs. The porches were the ways in which you related to people walking on the street, it kept the streets safe. And uh, it, it was something that uh, the, something that allowed for the opportunity to create community on the three floors. By the way, here's one more thing I need if you have, have anything. First of all, if, you're, if you have any pictures of triple deckers, please send them along. And, and I know Ken would be interested as well. Second, secondly, uh, I, I would love it if I've been looking all over for some picture, one picture is all I need of us, of people being nursed in the triple decker during the 1918 uh, uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. I thought if we could find that, because I also would love any conversation based on that, because my guess is that the triple deckers were used sort of as a sort of a mini hospital because it was all these families going up and down, helping each other, even if they weren't family members, they were friends and close, uh, close, close at the very least close tenants. Mm -hmm. Ken, did you look like you wanted to get excited about this idea of getting uh, <laughs> the idea of, uh, of, of the pandemic and, uh, and the triple decker? Yeah. Um, all, always, <laughs> Historic New England is always looking for these images. So thank you yeah. for saying sure. that. Absolutely. Any more questions, please? Yeah, I've got plenty. So how did the architecture of early three-deckers compare with the three-deckers that were built during later decades? Was there an evolution? There's an evolution in styles. You know, you see some of them early ones are sort of Victorian, a lot of flourishes, a lot of, you know, cupolas and all kinds of that. And I, please forgive me, I'm not an architectural architect and I don't know terms. A lot of ways they got somewhat simpler as they got older, but a lot of the the style has a lot to do with the finances, uh, what, what people could afford. If they could afford, you, you see, what's fascinating about it, especially with the anti-triple-decker people, they didn't realize or acknowledge the fact that there were all sorts of economic levels that were living in same neighborhoods. That was one of the great things about the triple-decker. It provided a kind of democracy of living situations. I grew up in an apartment building, a six floor apartment building in New York City. And while there was a community, it was nothing like what these triple deckers are. It was the perfect number, the perfect height for intimate relationships with the ability to uh, create some sort of niche for yourself as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you had the money, you could build uh, uh, lavishly and charge lavishly for it. If mm -hmm. you didn't, you, you built straight and simple. Uh, so if someone asked, uh, or someone states that they've been told it's three-decker officially and not triple-decker, <laughs> um, and in some cases they've been told that it's triple-decker officially right. and not three-decker. So right. what made you decide to go with triple-decker instead of three-decker for your program? Don't you think it sounds nicer with triple-decker? I, yeah, I, I myself say triple decker, but um, I'm also not from the uh, originally from the area, so I don't think so, my opinion counts. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is this is this is a debate that goes on. I think most scholars, and I think um, that Arthur Krim might have referred to them yeah. as three deckers, tend to do yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah. even some of the period literature says triple deckers. Yeah. So I grew up. You know, my grandmother lived in a triple decker. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do tend to find that scholars go more with three deckers. Yeah, but uh, we, we, we sometimes don't go by what scholars. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, next right. question. 
Keep them coming. Yep. Um, so what are your plans for completing and uh, showing the finished film? When, w timeline, where will it be shown, all that kind of stuff. Well, there's two, two aspects of the timeline. One is when is the uh, pandemic going to be over? It's mm. really hard to create intimacy of, uh, of uh, conversation to say nothing of filming in this culture right now. I mean, I just don't want to make a film with people wearing masks, to tell you the truth right now. It just doesn't, doesn't have that same sort of way of feeling intimate with the uh, people that you're interviewing. The other thing, as I said, I need another $100,000, which I was involved with um, uh, trying to raise before the pandemic came, but everything shut down. All the mm -hmm. granting agencies shut down practically. And, uh, you know, you can't just go to people's house and discuss them over a nice beer. Uh, in the pandemic. So it's if, if the pandemic ends, when the pandemic ends, and when I can raise that $100,000, after that, it'd be about another six or seven or eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who's interested, again, it's markjoellevitt <laughs> at gmail.com. I will put you on my mailing list and uh, let you know uh, where the um, where the premieres will be. I'm hoping to have a premiere in some of the major cities where I filmed, in, um, in Boston, in Worcester, in Providence. Uh, uh, but I'm also going to hopefully uh, have it on the public TV stations as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe a movie theater or two. I'd you, love to a movie theater. I, yeah. I just want to clarify, if I could comment, there's been a lot of um, comments in the chat about uh, Triple Decca. <laughs> and uh, other things going on there. And uh, it seems like in our audience, a lot of people do have experience with growing, living in them, ah. including whole families that lived in one building. All right, you gotta, was... get, you gotta get in touch with me. If you lived in the triple decker and you have stories about them and pictures of them, you've got to get in touch. That's your responsibility, okay? <laughs> yeah? Okay. And you'll, you'll share us with all that information. Claire, another question? Yep. So how will you address gentrification in your uh, finished film? As you, uh, you kind of touch on it in this, this clip but that I'm... you showed us, but how, how do you plan to, to go about that? Well, all the, all the um, interviews haven't been done yet. And mm -hmm. how I plan to do it is, uh, is somewhat dependent on who's available and who gives me the stories. But the reality is I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in, in poking blame at anybody. I'm interested in telling the story. Uh, and the story is that some of these structures uh, uh, were going through uh, hard times and were, um, were dependent on, on uh, either being raised or, uh, or gentrifying to some extent. Uh, you know, there's, these issues have nuances and subtleties. There's, there, there's enemies, there's, there's bad people and good people on each side of this issue. Uh, you saw the discussion that that young man had. He said it felt bad to do that. At the same time, I know the story from the, uh, those two people who lived in the house. So it's, a com it's complex. And I'm, in anything that I do as an artist, I'm interested in complexity rather than simplicity. Mm -hmm. So I will look for nuance rather than black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, another question is, is this the story you expected to be telling? <laughs> um, or have you found an unexpected story along the way as you made this film? Yeah, there's been all kinds of surprises, you know, all kinds of surprises. I, I work... Um, Right now I'm writing a book on something on, because I had to do something with myself during the pandemic. And it's about post pandemic education, how education, is, and how do I do it? I look around and what I'm interested in and I start reading and what I read starts connecting to something else that I've read and something else that I read connects to something else that I've read. And there's all kinds of ways in which you do any artistic project. It's part, um, planned and part spontaneous. Mm -hmm. If anybody has ever done anything like that, like I had all kinds of visions of what I was going to do. I'm sure I'm going to change this thing that you saw a great deal. That's what's so fun about working in the arts and anybody who does that probably understands that. It, it's about, it's about, get, it's about the, the strange relationship, the strange dialectic between control 
and lack of control. And once you accept that lack of control and lack of not knowing, uh, you're surprised. And the best thing for any artist is to be surprised. Mm -hmm. So um, are there any subjects, perspectives, or people that you don't have represented yet in your, um, in mm. your footage that are you hoping to connect with or include? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I, I haven't really thought about the film that much and about, you know, since the pandemic started, but it's a great question. Let me, give me a second here and I'll, um, I, I, I will uh, do it. Um, I want to cover the French Canadian uh, experience. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a trail that's kind of sometimes on and off among libraries uh, in uh, in the French Canadian community and about how they went and they built these triple deckers going up and down the uh, areas really all the way, you know, from up in Maine all the way through New England. Um, I, I want to really get that story down. Um, I'm trying to think. If I if I come up with more, I'll let you know. Write to me, and and I will. I I just I I because I've been away from it a little bit, and I've been more interested in this uh, other thing that I'm writing about now that I just don't remember. But there's there is there's about ten or so stories I know still that to to take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For that. Uh, so related, someone asks if the carpenters who built mm. the triple deckers were French Canadians. Um, and who came up with the original plan for the triple decker? Was it an architect? Was it a developer? What was right. the story there? Again, in any folk literature, it's all up into debate. And this is a this is a generic structure. There's some people say that uh, it was French Canadians that built it. Some people say there was not a the French Canadian built it. Some people say that. Uh, that, that it was built with a certain kind of style that was evolved from something up in Canada. You know, I've heard, you know, it's funny. It, it, I guess it all follows these kinds of, kinds of uh, themes. It's basically, it's, it's basically in a vernacular form of architecture. You're always looking for the, 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 the first one. And yet, the, who knows? I don't think there's ever been a discussion. There's been a lot of discussion about it. I don't think there's ever been some decisively, you know, here you're looking at the first triple decker mm. ever. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what someone else had asked. Where were the earliest triple deckers built? It depends on what you consider a triple decker. Mm. Uh, the, you know, that's, that's some of the complexity that people will look up in Canada for some, people will look in Jersey for some, people will see some examples in uh, every, every state, every, every part of, of New England. Really what happened a lot with these, what, what, and again, let's see if I can remember this, is that what really changed was the way in which your utilities were, uh, were charged. Mm. Making a triple decker and putting it close together, you were you were you were not charged with how high something was, but how much land you were taking up. Mm -hmm. So the triple decker became an apartment essentially, mm. you know, for people who wanted to to make it a, a good investment, buy something and then rent the two properties, and they built it up. And as they built it up, they took less footprint in the middle, so mm -hmm. the taxes on things like water or gas or whatever it was was less than it would be if you sprawled out. I see. Yeah, so, so it's really hard to say where the first one was, but we know that the, 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 um, the amount of building of these really paralleled the Industrial Revolution. You really do know about 1850, 1860, 1870, it was really beginning. And at that point, it took off like a, like, like, like a, like a burnt building. Mm -hmm. And it was, took off and it paralleled. If you go to any of these cities, and, and most of you know this, I'm sure, if you go to any of these cities uh, of early, uh, you know, of, of the sort of later early stage of industrial revolution, you see them everywhere. You know, absolutely everywhere. In, in, um, you know, in, uh, in, in, in Providence, in, you know, uh, uh, Providence and Worcester and uh, Lewiston, Maine, you, that's what mm -hmm. you see. You see triple deckers and you see the factories. 
You know, you don't see one without the other because the triple deckers live in a context. They live in a social context. Nothing is by itself. No one goes out into the forest and says, I will stay here and I will build a triple decker. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this part, it's part of an entire, entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's the way you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's an ecosystem where people from around the world are coming together. They have stores, people get information about where to get jobs. And it's just this beautiful sort of integrated system of life, friendship and uh and uh and uh, uh, uh work mm -hmm. so someone wants a clarification between a uh, triple decker and a tenement are they interchangeable um how would you just define a tenement as opposed to a triple decker uh it depends how often racist you are <laughs> and, and the tenement is a negative way of talking about a, a certain kind of tenement. It's a triple as a way of, to, you know, they use tenement as a disparaging uh, 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 mm -hmm. a, a concept. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, wouldn't you say that, Ken? I, I, I would. And yeah. in some of the literature, you, you even that I threw up a slide, showed that. But I, I tend to think that tenements um, are more than three. I, I think there are many more apartments. They're, they're larger. And if anyone has not been to the Tenement Museum yeah, that's a good in point. New York City, you should absolutely go after the pandemic when it opens and see what life was like. I mean, those were really single apart, almost two rooms or one yeah. room that a whole family lived in. So there is that difference in terms of how large they were. Um, they're, you know, and tenements, you know, kind of run parallel at the same time as triple deckers. But triple deckers, I think, Mark, and you, you're the more of an expert, um, also were originally purported to be much better. Someone commented, you had light coming in on all right. sides. You had good ventilation because of those windows on both sides and also with the porches mm -hmm. or someone said piazza. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so I think, you know, in, in many ways they, they, they were much, much healthier than living in a squalid tenant. Um, also, you know, there are tenement museums in Glasgow. There's a new one that just opened last year in Dublin. Uh, but these were, you know, many, many families living in a much smaller, smaller space. No question. But then you read the literature, especially when they were banned uh, and not allowed. They all were called tenements. Mm. When they when they wanted to ban them, that they became tenements essentially. And and the other thing to understand is that the there's such a huge range of these to, of triple deckers. The summer, like I said, extremely gorgeous. I mean, if you go to Worcester uh, and you can write to me and I can let you know where to go there, there's these gorgeous, beautiful houses. And then sometimes they're these just flat, mundane places. What's great about these, other than the fact that they create a community, affordable places to live, is that is that they also they they, they also created neighborhoods. They created strong neighborhoods. Where people got talked to each other and 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 spoke about where they could get particular things, it was the way into the into the a country, and they they had an amazing effect that way. Um, but like I said, uh, they were considered sometimes sort of like the the first Brahmins did not like them. The Brahmins were not happy that they were starting to come. In fact, they were banned in a number of cities, as you know. Uh, in, in New England. And it was really the Brahmins. They didn't like the fact that here's what, this was an interesting thought. They didn't like that people that were not related might see each other intimately walking up and down the stairs. <laughs> so it offended their a sense of their own morality. The Brahmins were very concerned with making sure that no one gets excited by seeing skin on someone. So they didn't want anybody to look inside those, uh, those buildings where the intimacy was so available. So um, that's uh, was something you mentioned earlier um, 
about how some are, are very beautiful on the outside um, and some are plain. Um, someone asked if you um, have encountered examples of trickle deckers that have tried to disguise themselves as a single family home or something that they're not. Um, you know, at, at, at they mentioned adding the pitched roof um, on the top of some of them for a, with a smaller apartment in there. But are there other examples of how um, the triple decker was kind of um, uh, disguised from the outside? They didn't disguise them, but they were, you know, like any, uh, any builders, any, any group of people, they're affected by the styles around them. And, you know, there is always the sense that a triple decker in, in certain circles again, and, and again, you look at pictures of old communities where uh, I have some old photos of, uh, of, um, of Woonsocket, a major triple decker city, where you just have the destruction of these very poor looking uh, uh, triple deckers. Now they're not gonna do the affectations. They're not gonna get into Victorian. It costs money. So it, it, it has to be someone who has a little money to invest in these things, builds that way and understands that they're going to also attract uh, ways to pay that, that maybe is a little more than someone who's simply, uh, you know, basically lined, the houses are lined up really, you know, and, and don't have that kind of feeling at all. Um, they did, another thing to be very interested in about it to me is, the, is uh, that many of them had gardens Remember, these people came from, uh, from Europe, so they had gardens, they had styles of gardening that they had right outside of their houses, and interesting too, many of them had, depending on the culture, had wine grapes, mm. and they would make their own wine down the basements. Most of these, you go downstairs and you see where they made their wine. So it was, a, uh, it was an amazing thing, and then imagine too, the smells of the food that was going on constantly there on the three floors. Mm -hmm. You know, the, so, so think about these things, not only as a structure by itself, but think of it as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a community of people going up and down the stairs, you know, yelling at someone to come downstairs, playing music with people on different floors, which they did. Um, and, and cooking food. Imagine, I've been told by so many people that the smells were incredible. <laughs> and the, the food was just wonderful. So, so again, these are, these are ways in which it's more than a, 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 a place to dwell. It's a place to live and self-create. Because one of the things about a house is that it allows you to be who you are in whatever way it is. And in some ways, it gives you a sort of sense of who you are as well. Houses are, 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 are as much as a, someone put on a suit, they're much as people creators as that. They create the way you feel, how you, how you fit into the society. Because remember, these people are, are in flux. A lot of them are in flux, meaning they've come to a new country, they've come with a family, and they have to try to figure out how to behave. Mm -hmm. Those Victorian houses say a lot on how to behave. It's almost like uh, there's a story <laughs> about um, uh, Central Park and Olmsted wanted as many promenades as you could have in the park. Why? Because uh, the upper and middle classes would teach through their walking on these promenades, the immigrant rabble, how to behave and how to look. Well, these triple deckers, especially these ones that had these more Victorian effects to it, um, did the same thing. It taught you how to live. It taught you how to communicate. It, I believe that the, in some ways that the New Deal was formed by the culture that was formed by the triple decker, the sense of com community, the sense of interdependency, and in some ways, I feel that we've lost that. Hmm. So some, uh, a couple of people asked about fire hazards and triple deckers since they were wooden, they were multifamily housing. Yeah. Did they have a particular risk to fire? You mean, do they? Or, or yes, do <laughs> they have a particular risk for fire? I have a collection of fire pictures. Hmm. That's huge. And they're getting more and more now because uh, certain cities purposely burn them down hmm. to get rid of them. Wow. Their vision of a city is, uh, is a suburb. 
Uh, mm-hmm. right, and they didn't, they're people who recognize the, the power of these places and the, the wealth of them. There's others who say, you know, they're just slums, essentially. Mm. So yeah, I, I have about, I'd say 40 pictures of it. That Someone asked, what else am I gonna study? I'm, there's a bunch of very f- well-known firemen photographers around. So I'm gonna do a lot of research on the fires and the pictures that I can get out of that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. no, no. Um, let's, I'm trying to see if I can combine some of these. Sure. Um, so there's um, questions about um, triple deckers and uh, more dense urban housing. Um, do you think that uh, COVID will impact uh, the further development of uh, dense urban housing? And is a triple decker a good model for creating more uh, dense urban affordable housing? They are, there is a movement afoot to make the triple decker a, 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 a go-to mm. style of housing. Uh, I've hear, heard about it a number of places now already. Um, from one friend of mine is starting to build them, uh, wants to build them as a, as, a, as a form of affordable housing. I know in Boston, they're, they're working with the triple decker as a model. Um, I think people recognize the power of that model of a way of creating community, even if it's a condominium, uh, it still creates more community often than, than, than a single family home. Um, I, 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 in terms of the airflow, it's, as you were saying, you know, in terms of the airflow, uh, it certainly provides that and it provides community, you know? So I, I, I think it's a perfect uh, uh, model for uh, housing. And I think it's going to be continued. I don't think it's da- more, any more dangerous in terms of understanding the, the now going to be always thought about pandemic. Um, so someone had asked about uh, the persistence and renewal of triple deckers. Um, it sounds like you think that they have a, a bright future um, and that people are, are going to start to revive them. Um, it, even despite gentrification, and uh, as you mentioned, some people burning them down. Do you do you think it's maybe going to be community by community, or do you think that triple deckers are going to have a wide revival? I would hope they'd have a wide revival. I I don't necessarily believe that they will, because one of the issues that people have, and again, this is the issue of money. I don't want to make uh, uh, someone guilty about this. They make them into condominiums now. Mm-hmm. You'll see them in, uh, in, in, in the Boston area a great deal. So what does that do basically? It, it, it's, it gives housing, which is great. It's a lovely place. They're always fixed up because they're being, gonna be sold for quite a bit of money. You know, if you go to any of these towns in the, in the Boston area, the problem is it doesn't create the same social cohesion that it did as a triple decker. In some ways, the triple decker as a, as a housing form is, is a porous form of housing. Mm. Things just flow back and forth. You know, you can't not uh, uh, bump into someone walking down the stairs. You have to learn the civility of negotiating space. You know, people, how do you walk that way or that way? You have to look at them in the eye and you have to say, good morning, Mr. And so naughty or something, you know, good morning, Mr. Jones, you know, you have to create a civil society. When someone goes on vacation or, or has to go back to the old, can you take my mail out for me and bring it into the house? So in a condominium, you can live in a condominium and not know your neighbors. You can't live in a triple decker and not know your neighbors. Mm-hmm. You hear their music. You smell their food. <laughs> you know when someone's sick. You know you know you know when something's tragic happened. You hear it all, and you don't have the same obsession for privacy that we have uh, now uh, 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 embraced. So the form itself is good. It will always be there and always good. The 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 actual living like you live in an old time triple decker, that's gonna be harder to continue because everybody wants private space now. Everybody, yeah. 
One thing I just want to throw yeah, in yeah, thank really you. kind of encouraging is that, you know, there are organizations, as you, you featured one in your film about Worcester, that are really, and neighborhood associations that are actively trying to preserve some of these buildings. The use is going to change. Yes, they may become condos and it's going to be different. Yeah. Uh, but one one part of it is, you know, we want to we want to preserve the physical buildings, too. And as you're doing, tell the stories of the different groups of immigrants that came through and made these their homes and became Americans. I mean, I think that's such a beautiful part of your story. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I look, I'm a very I've always been very interested in the sense of place. What is place? You know, place is history. Place is 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 ecology. Place is 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 a garden that you see next door to someone's house who's you know came over from another country. And the more you can create a sense of place, the more you have a sense of responsibility to where you live. The more you have a sense of belonging where you live. And I'm a very big advocate of of that. I I, I believe people need a sense of place in order to feel rooted some mm -hmm. fashion or another. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple questions about porches. Um, it, did the, the fact that triple deckers tend to have porches uh, stem from the emphasis on health and air and, you know, uh, uh, having that kind of fresh air as a, a component of healthy living? And also, it seems strange to uh, one of our uh, viewers that porches were a common feature, even though it's quite cold um, here. Um, so what was the thinking behind having porches on these houses? I'm not sure exactly what happened with them, but I do know that they're, they're not just, they were places for people to sit, but they also were places to put the icebox. Mm. They were places where uh, food was uh, dried they were practical places as well as uh, places of social socializing. They could, yeah, Ken, yeah. No, no, I mean, one, yeah. one of our, um, someone put in the q and I think it was Robert, you yeah. know, um, did these come out of the 19th century, century emphasis on healthy living? And I yeah. think, I think to a degree, yeah, yeah, for yeah, all these things, as you said, you know, for an ice box, for socializing, but I think also some of it may well have come out of that um, healthy yeah. living, looking at that. I like yeah. that idea. I'll look that up. I didn't, I, I didn't think about that, but that's a really, it's a really good point. Again, what, what is, what's going on in the culture? Yep. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So um, are there any examples of triple deckers beyond New England? <laughs> um, there are things that sort of come up every once in a while that say, well, Jersey has some that's made out of brick. Uh, you know, maybe there's three sort of some facsimile of them in certain cities. But I haven't seen anything that, you know, compares to both the style as well as the... Remember, you, you rarely see a triple-decker by itself. They're very lonely. <laughs> they like to be surrounded by other 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 spaces and I, that's what i've never seen i've never seen places where there's the intensity of you know every a lot of places have their own vernacular architecture you know everything from the you know the stoops in new york to to, to chicago's you know whatever that is there or san francisco those old you know wonderful you know what do they call them the such and such ladies you know painted the, ladies painted ladies right <laughs> but i i haven't seen anything like in New England, and I've traveled quite a bit in, in anywhere like, except New England. I've never seen this particular mm -hmm. style. So um, we have some questions about uh, the, uh, getting people for your film and uh, where you're planning on doing uh, filming and interviews. Um, so how do you identify people to yeah. include in your film? Are you going to do more filming in Boston or in Western Massachusetts, perhaps, since um, it seemed like it was mostly you were filming in uh, smaller cities? Well, no, I, I did Boston. I did a lot of Boston. Um, uh, I'm going to do filming everywhere, I, anywhere, you know, uh, um, anywhere that um, Triple Deckers are. I want to get mostly every city that has some 
strong connection to them. Like for instance, I just got someone who asked me to go to Torrington, Connecticut. Mm. Now I wouldn't even have thought that was a, you know a place where triple deckers were were significant, but they had a big community of triple deckers because they had a big industrial base. That whole area of um, you know from uh, what's the Norwich Norwich Connecticut not Norwich what's the, what's the one on the far uh, western side of Connecticut? Norwalk no no not Norwalk no it's a it's a factory town it's a, it was a big copper center oh. yeah you know right. <laughs> <laughs> I know my mind. Sorry. Me too. Uh, but so I'm going to go to all the all the cities. This I'm going to do a lot more work in New Hampshire. I haven't done work in New Hampshire. There's some towns up in um, in, uh, in 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 uh, in Maine that I haven't gotten to. There's a lot of smaller towns in Massachusetts that I haven't visited that I want to connect to. Um, no, I I I I do love going all around and and doing that. And how did I find out about these people? How did I do it? That's one of the great things about making a film really is like, you know, you begin to read an article here and an article there. You begin to find an expert here, an expert there. You begin to, one person gives you someone else. Again, it's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, once you enter into this ecosystem, you're into this flow. Once you're into the flow, you're creating the opportunities yourself. And then you're meeting other people who give you new opportunities. It's a, it's a, it's a marvelous, marvelous process of mm -hmm. uh, creating a community. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some questions about um, the construction and um, the ornamentation. So um, how much did they cost um, in comparison to how much people made at that point uh, that they were being built? Um, and that, um, you know, the, the interiors are often very beautiful with built-in woodwork. Um, and why, why was this kind of um, ornamentation um, a priority in building worker housing when you know, things like cost might be uh, an issue. Because you had probably different levels, and again, I'm not sure about this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you probably had different levels of people working. Mm -hmm. You know, like in any factory situation, you have the very, you know, you have people who are basically doing the real strong manual work that weren't paid great deals. You also had next levels of people, maybe a, a, the next level of bureaucrat, or maybe someone who's working with paper, working with, uh, uh, billing or something like that. So you probably had a wide range of people's uh, economic status, which justified a certain amount of money that they could spend, which justified a certain amount of affectations and building that, that it allowed. So it wasn't just one class of people that lived in these. You can, see, if you go all around New England, you'll see people who must have had a chunk of money because of the beautiful woodwork inside these places or the sometimes even the um you know the the uh, ornamenting of the lights mm. you know the the floors are gorgeous but remember and then too that the costs were not the same way and the the, the forests were virginal and you had a lot of access to wood basically and you had people that were believed in a certain kind of fealty to craft mm -hmm. as well. The other thing about Triple Decker I want to make a point in, and there's a great book, and I forgot his name now, is about the fluidity of the spaces in a Triple Decker. And by that, I mean, you could, you, you there was a, a, a time when people turned a, a, an extra room into a room for wakes. They had wake room, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that called? Yeah. And there was uh, times when you needed more money. So you kind of bundle, put more people in the, in the triple decker. Triple decker is this incredible uh, flexible space that uh, allows for constant change and alterations. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the money available, the, the, the people that have come over from another country, it went through lots of alterations. It became, mm -hmm. As, as, did the, as did the outside. The gardens of many people's houses were knocked down for, as you can imagine, driveways. So uh, that relates to something else. Someone asked the square footage. Did they all have a similar square footage or was there a Y range? There was a, a range of them, although they, 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 I don't know the exact, do you know, you don't know them. I don't know the exact uh, names of them. 
not, not the exact na uh, sizes of them at all. Mm -hmm. There was a range of them. You know, you can see that as you drive around. You know, but again, they 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 are not mansions. They're not they're not they're not uh, um, uh, uh, suburban houses that stretch you know into the uh, 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 grass. You know, they have a certain constraint because most of them are built within an urban environment. And they depend on that somewhat of a constraint for lowering taxes. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think to finish up, I'm going to ask uh, one more question. So uh, someone saw your uh, performance about the families in the Triple Deckers that oh, you nice. had done a few years ago and mm -hmm. was wondering if um, that will make any appearance in this new mm -hmm. film. No, I won't. I won't. Um, it's that piece that I did about 35, 40 years ago, and I did it about 20 times, 30 times, and I had the text, and I, I, I had this incredible rotating group of musicians that played music to uh, uh, exemplify certain emotions, ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera, and I loved, loved doing it. Um, we've had deaths and births and marriages and all kinds of things within this group of about 10 people who, 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 who did this. Um, it won't be in this really, I don't think. Um, I don't think so. I, I don't, don't think so because what I want to do is... Uh, um, That's another, know, another film, another project, Mark. It might be another project, <laughs> but tell them that whoever asked that, thank you very much. And, and thank you for coming to see the, um, the piece. I, I, it's one of my great things that I have ever done in my life was <laughs> to work with those musicians from all, all around the world and to, to work with various keys. And I still remember the first time we got everybody together, the first group together, there was about 10, about seven different ethnic groups working with, in, with me. And most of them didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to speak to each other in languages that neither one, no one knew. <laughs> and it was just this heartfelt, wonderful uh, uh, experience. Probably one of my best in my life, both as an artist, but as a human being as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah.